FAA Safe and Unsafe Medications webinar. And uh, so what it is, the first chapter in my book is on what medications you can't be on in order to get your medication, in order to get your certificate. So that's always very, very important. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's see, go here, let's see here. There. So who am I? I got my private pilot before probably most of you were even born. So I got it in 1984, two days before my son was born. I got my instrument rating in 1992, which you can see there's a little bit of area. So I tried to go to every single place for the $100 hamburger. Then I got my commercial rating when I decided, okay, I'm going to become an instructor. Again, you can see it takes me a long, long time to uh, two years between when I got my commercial rating when I got my CFI and I got my CF double in 2013 and I only had 10 hours left on my knowledge test uh, before I had to get this thing done and I had to start all over again. So, And there's me at the hospital. You notice my hair, well, if you've met me, my hair is a little bit white but uh, I always wear bow ties and the reason why because they make me look taller and they don't collect the bugs. So when I'm talking to patients, what I'm doing is I'm using, if I had a long tie, it would be like a Petri dish. So everybody knew what I had for lunch every time I went to the bathroom. So I was doing like doing a urine dipstick test. So that's me. So what I did is, uh, oh, probably about five years ago, I wrote the number 10 most read article in the world on how to bring people back to life. So we have these things called cold blue. I do CPR, I shock them, I give them medications, and I bring them back. So I've actually had a couple within the last 24 hours that were both successful. Um, I do yoga twice a week. Um, that is me in the background. Um, and if you believe that, I got some swamp land in Midland, Michigan I'd like to sell you. And so the other thing that I want to do is I want to thank all the people that are responsible for all the wonderful experiences I've had out there in N0A land. So first I want to thank Jason and Ashley and that's like my newest like grand niece right there. So I want to thank Jason, Ashley and Ella Shepard at N0A.com. I want to thank my instructor because every instructor has an instructor, Shelby Poe. Then I also want to thank and I dedicate this presentation. There's Mrs. Diamond on the right, Yvonne, there's my son Andrew. And I want to thank them. And I also want to thank my like son, Mike, who we miss tremendously. And I just want to announce, uh, probably about three weeks ago, there's my son over on the left. He just got his doctorate of physical therapy. So this is the new Dr. Andrew Diamond. And there's me on the right because I am a professor over at the medical school and the DP school. And, I, and there's my lovely wife, Yvonne, that I bribed in order to marry me 35 years ago. So the disclaimer is I'm not a physician. I have my doctorate in pharmacy. This presentation is for informational purposes only for my flying friends. And so a lot of people, when they hear me talk, they say, okay, what's your office hours? Let me do a physical on you. Well, that's not where it was. I could have got into medical school, but I decided if I got my doctorate in pharmacy that I could actually have some time to go flying and see my family. So that's the reason why I'm not a physician. Um, the other most fantastic resource in order to find medications, if you are a member of AOPA, there is the website. They have safe medication list. But what I want to also, a little bit of a disclaimer there, there's a lot of medications on there that have the wrong indications, nothing against our AOPA folks. And there's also some medications that have been taken off the market as long as probably five or four uh, years ago. So the three biggest fears of the general public are public speaking, which I'm doing right now, flying, which I do, and death. And I have no control over death. Whenever it happens, it's going to happen. So I actually do two out of the three biggest fears in the world. So the biggest fear of us, students, and all pilots around the world are this, getting and keeping their medical. So that's why I was so passionate about writing this book. I've had multiple students. I've actually helped probably about six students get their medical without having to go through Oklahoma City and waiting six to nine months to get their medical. So some of the FARs on medical, since I know all the FARs, if you look at 61.53, there is an FAR that says as pilot in command or part of the required flight crew, you have to know or has reason to know of any, or any medical condition that would make you unable to perform to what your medical certificate is. And number two is very important. 
are you taking any medications or receiving other treatment for a medication that will make you unable to fly? And then there's 91.17 that says no person may act or attempt to act as a crew member while using any drug that affects the person's facilities that will be contrary to safety. So the medical certificate, you've all seen this, even as a student when you go in. I want you to pay close attention to where the box is. 17A in particular says this. Do you currently use any medication, prescription, or look very closely, non-prescription? So if you are taking over-the-counter medications on a regular basis, are you taking any herbal products or supplements, which may be okay as long as they don't cause any drowsiness, but you need to put that on your medical certificate. And I can feel all the tension already out there when you kind of put that on your medical certificate. Um, I do the pilot checklist. I am safe checklist is actually tattooed on me. I do it every single day. I do an I am safe checklist when I get into the car. I do an I am safe checklist when I take a shower. But the one that's most important for us today is have I been taking any prescription or over-the-counter drugs before I go fly? So medication plays a huge role in our decision to fly, keep our medic, uh, medicals, and to stay healthy. Because these medications save lives. They prolong life. They give you a better quality of life. So what is really flying fit? It's to be able to have a quality, a standard, a type of physical being where you are both going to be healthy. So good health means you also regularly have physical exercise. So in order to get your first class, second class, third class, or even student pilot certificate, you must be flying fit. So if you look at a verb, using fit as a verb, it's be able to be in the right shape or size. So when I use fit, not just from the physical standpoint, but the physical standpoint, can you even fit into your aircraft? I, multiple times I do a lot of discovery flights. And I always tell them, I said, do not give me a 300-pound person in August when the temperature is 95 degrees and put somebody who's in that in a 1 in 52 because you want to save money. Because number one, they will never be able to get into that airplane no matter how much yoga that they do. So fit is also be able to fit into the aircraft. So what, in my opinion, would be the perfectly fit pilot, both on or off medications? Well, you got to be over 17. Blood pressure has to be less than 155 over 95. Your blood glucose, which means how sweet you are, is between 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. Your LDL, if you're probably over the age of 50, should be somewhere around 100 to 140. Your good cholesterol, your HDL, should be somewhere around 50. You should be working out three to five times a week. And you should be, I'm not telling people what to do, but this is what I do, the Mediterranean diet. And someone like this, uh, I'm not, well, you know, that's me. And so when you fill out your air certificate, you're also putting in all your hours. And also, what you need to know, am I physically fit when I do my medical? So here's my numbers. 62, blood pressure is 118 over 78. My sweetness is 100 milligrams per deciliter. My LDL is 72. My HDL is 50. And I take a Torvastat, which is Lipitor, because I have very, very bad family genetics. So things you cannot take and get your medical. You'll never be able, if you're on tranquilizers, antidepressants, anxiolytics, which means things like Xanax, things like that, stimulants, if you're on Adderall, Ritalin, things like that, uh, antipsychotics and anticonvulsants will be unsafe medications and you won't be able to get your medical. But recently, because of the great data of using these four antidepressant medications, they're called SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, and Lexapro are now allowed with special insurance. There was tons of information that says really what it is is these make people healthy. They fly healthy. They are healthy. And these things have very few side effects. Taking Vicodin, Oxycontin, Altram is a no-no. Bottom line is if there's a medication that's going to continually affect your mood, concentration, cognition, or wakefulness, you do not fly. So we're going to talk about a few disease states, and we're going to talk about over-the-counter medications. We'll be talking about hypertension, diabetes, pain, insomnia, and some of the most common over-the-counter medications. So there's a lot of words here. 
Bottom line is hypertension is a silent killer. People feel great when they're hypertensive. They're perfusing. Their heart is really pumping out a lot of blood to the brain and the kidneys. And so if you stay hypertensive for a long period of time, you have an increased risk for stroke, which to me is a brain attack, a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, kidney disease, bleeding in the retina, generalized atherosclerosis, which means hardening of the arteries. The FAA standards, and I'll make it very simple, your blood pressure readings can't be over 155 over 95. But what you do is before you go and get your medical, initially what you'll do, you take your blood pressure twice a day for three consecutive days, both in the morning and the evening. And if at least six of those readings are 155 over 95 or less, you are then qualified and there will be no further action required and you can get your certificate. So if you are not taking any medications and your blood pressure is less than 155 or 95, you are good to go. Congratulations. If you are taking from one to three medications that are approved by the FAA and your blood pressure is less than 155 to 95, you are good to go and you will get your medical. So some li simple lifestyle changes. So if you know you're hypertensive, if you lose 10% of your body weight, you will decrease your blood pressure by 10%. An example is if you weigh 240 pounds, blood pressure is 165 over 95. If you take 10% off of that, you will now be 216 pounds, and your blood pressure will be 144 over 85, which shows it's less than 155 over 95. You should be exercising five times a week for at least an hour. Everybody knows that the high salt diets cause an increase in sodium, which then causes an increase in blood pressure. Hot off the presses, sugar and processed foods may now be the biggest dietary cause of hypertension. There was a new study that just came out in December. Diets low in saturated fat, rich in fruits and vegetables, grain, breads, fish. Now you know what the Mediterranean diet is. Diets high in monounsaturated fats is fantastic, things like avocados. If you smoke, stop now and do not take Shantix. So there's the article that shows the majority of hypertension is now due to all the sugar and processed foods. So think of your arteries as pipes, and the blood is what flows through these pipes. So if you have a normal pipe and a normal amount of blood going through, you have normal blood pressure. If you have too much fluid, too much blood going through a normal pipe, your blood pressure will be high. If you have normal blood flow but have very narrow pipes, blood pressure will be high. So these are a few of the medications that you'll see in hypertension. Patients will be described what we call diuretics or what they'll call water pills. What they do gets rid of water. Most importantly, gets rid of sodium. It'll also get rid of potassium and calcium. So it could cause osteoporosis if you don't take a calcium supplement. Some common names for it are hydrochlorothiazides, Lasix, how it got its name because it lasts six hours. You don't want to take that twice a day and take it late after 6 p.m. because you'll be visiting the porcelain palace throughout the night. Bumex is another diuretic that's in the same category. We have vasodilators. So if you dilate the blood vessel, more blood and then carry more oxygen to all the parts of the body. One of the medications that does that is called Norvas. We have heart rate lowering medications. It lets the heart fill the bottom part of the heart so it can pump out more blood to the brain and the kidneys and extremities. Some examples of those are Toprol XL, Coreg, Indorol. And just a little common fact, 80% of the PGA is on Indorol. And what they, they're using that actually for stage fright. So I'm really, really very popular in the hospital when I have any of the residents and interns going to be doing a big lecture in front of 300 people. They'll come, they'll get their 10 milligrams of Indorol, they'll take it, and all their stage fright goes away. Another common example of an antihypertensive, vaso, a vasodilator and a sodium and water eliminator called ACE inhibitors. Examples of those are lisinopril, acupril, and enalapril. These are my recommendations to reduce hypertension throughout the United States. So what I believe is all bathrooms at work should be one mile away. So you get a lot of exercise running to the bathroom, and you have a nice leisurely one-mile walk back. All fast food restaurants should be very expensive. Healthy food should be cheap. All chairs should be like pogo sticks. The only thing you do if I give a big presentation in a big auditorium, you just have to synchronize the presentation. So using 
the I am safe checklist and thinking about hypertension, I stands for illness. So if you wake up, you have a headache and it's not due to any festivities from the night before, caffeine withdrawal, you feel your heart pounding, your blood pressure may be way too high. And that headache actually may be a forewarning of a stroke, which will be a brain attack. Maybe you forgot you're taking twice a day antihypertensives because you were so rushed to get out to the airport. Also being rushed is not a good thing for you to go flying anyway. Medications, if you're feeling dizzy, feeling like you want to pass out, having problems concentrating, that may be due to your medication. It could be a side effect. And so whenever a new medication is started by your physician, what you need to do, you need to be on that medication for at least three weeks with no side effects. Sometimes it takes your body anywhere between three days to maybe two weeks for it to start to get used to it. So that's the recommendation I make to people when they get new medications in their pilots. Do not fly for at least three weeks till you know for sure you're not going to get any side effects up in the airplane. So diabetes, what diabetes means really is siphoned because these the patients really like pee a lot. And so back in the olden days, the way they diagnosed diabetes is they would taste their urine and it, it would be sweet because they're eliminating a lot of glucose in your urine. I know that sounds sick. Hopefully everybody already ate. So insulin is produced in the pancreas. It's needed to get the glucose into the cell for energy. There's two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is where the pancreas produces zero insulin. So when you eat a meal, normally the pancreas will produce insulin, take that glucose as floating around in the serum, getting into the cells for energy. If you don't have insulin, it'll just stay really, really high, and being really, really sweet or hyperglycemic is not good. Diabetes type 2 is where the pancreas produces a less amount of insulin or it produces poorly functioning insulin. So can a diabetic fly per the FAA? And the answer is absolutely. If the person is a diabetic type 2, they can get their first class, second class, and third class. These pilots will be treated with the oral agents. But here's the big but. The pilot applicant will need to get an authorization of special issuance for a medical certificate. Now in diabetes type 2, you can see you can get a first class and there's the FARs for second class and third class. So what they do is they read the report of the primary physician when the pilots apply for it. They look at their medications, they look at their doses, their side effects. They do a test called the hemoglobin A1C and that sees how sweet you are for the past three months. The normal numbers for that is 4.5 to 6%. And then the, uh, person, the physician will look at the patient's eyes and kidneys, a heart, and their brain. So the, some of the medications that, that we use in diabetes type 2 are uh, what I call sulfonylureas. They're squeezers. What they do is they squeeze as much of the insulin that either is low amount or poorly functional out of the pancreas. Examples are glyburide, amaryl, glucotrol. Medications that will decrease the production of glucose from glycogen in the liver and it will decrease glucose absorption are called metformin and actose. And actually metformin helps people, the diabetics, lose weight and it gets your cholesterol down. So it's an added little advantage. Medications that will increase in, uh, insulin production, decrease uh, sugar production in the liver is called Genuvia. So the goal to keep your medical, if you are a diabetic type 2, is keep your glucose under control. Your sweetness, your hemoglobin A1C is normal, stable, you have no hypoglycemic effects, and then you are no risk to aviation safety. So in diabetes type 1, people are taking insulin. You can only get a third class medical. It's with an AME associated special issuance, which is called an AASI. It's very important for new students who have diabetes type 1. It's just like taking your written, get it out of the way even before you start your flying lessons to start the process early before you apply for your student pilot certificate. The criteria is to get and to keep your third class medical is really, really very rigorous. You have to follow the process. You have to have two aglobin E1Cs with the 90 days that are normal. You have to have a diary of your blood glucose levels. If you're over 40, you need to say an EKG because diabetics have a high rate of having heart attacks. So they want to make sure you're not having any ischemia. Some of the examples of the insulin medications we have out there are Humalog, Humulin, Lantus, Nodalins. Here's some examples of what they look like. And actually, this one's really expensive. I was trying to get a patient on this today. It costs $399 for one vial of this Lantus. So if you are flying and you are a diabetic type 1, you have your third-class medical, you've got to carry a glucometer, which is a little machine. It takes a little uh, fingerprint. 
and then it takes the blood and it reads it within a couple minutes. And so you also must have 10 gram portions of glucose ready. And there is like a little example of glucose tablets. You can get them at any of the, the pharmacies around your area. So a half an hour before the flight, you need to check your glucose. If it's less than 100, you got to take 10 grams of glucose and then test it one hour after you take those tablets. So you can see it's already very rigorous. And this is before you even take off. So if it's between 100 and less than 300, you are good to fly. If it's greater than 300, you cancel the flight. And so you must keep your glucose level within, you test it within one hour intervals. Less than 100, take 20 of glucose. Between 100 and less than 300, you don't have to do anything. If it's in 300, you need to land at the nearest airport, inject yourself, and wait till the level gets between 100 and 300. I, kind of, I can see everybody out there is already scratching their head. And it's really really, really important. I got a call. I was flying from Kalamazoo, Michigan back to Ann Arbor and one of the instructors actually called me in the air and said he has a student that is not comprehending anything that he was saying. I said, look at his belt. And he says, what are you talking about? I said, look for a little box. And he says, I found it. I said, what is in there is insulin. I said, he is hypoglycemic. You need to land as soon as possible. You need to find some milk or some orange juice or apple juice. You need to get his sugar up and you got to find out, did he tell the medical examiner that he was a diabetic? Because that's really, really scary. If you are in a high workload, if, I'm, if I have a diabetic that's going to be shooting an approach or getting adverse weather, automatically take 10 grams of glucose because you need your brain to work in order to shoot that down to minimums. So signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. So even if you're a diabetic or not, you can still be hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. So hyperglycemia had like 14 candy bars before you went flying. You may have blurred vision, confusion, headache, fatigue, a fruity breath, and you actually go into a coma. And you think, well, you know, after that many like candy bars, they shouldn't do that. Well, if you overstimulate the pancreas, it's going to do that. Hypoglycemia is shakiness, dizziness, sweatiness, nervousness, confusion, inability to form tests. That exactly is what happened to that pilot that I got called on. He was also tachycardic. He was having heart palpitations. He couldn't see. He was probably really close to losing consciousness. Thank goodness there was an instructor on board where they could land. So look, using the IM safe checklist, if they feel jittery, if that's all in your mind is just to get to the airport, you got up late and didn't have time for any nourishment. You've heard Jason talk about at least what you know our diets are. I always have oatmeal four hours before I go flying. I'll have maybe some juice or I'll have some tea or I'll have some coffee. I'm a coffee drink drinker, so I love coffee, but I wait at least like two or three hours before I go flying because I don't want to have to pee if I'm shooting an approach somewhere. So if you are so rushed, you forgot your take your oral antiglycemic such as glucotrol. You got to the airport one hour late, you're confused. All of a sudden, you're really tired. It's never too late to use the I am safe checklist if you're taking medications. So let's talk about pain. So the reason, if you look at the, the nouns and the synonyms and with the meaning of pain, look at it. physical suffering or discovery caused by illness or injury. She's in great pain. So my kind of like saying to that does not sound like something you wanted to fly with, and I hope you don't fly with pain. So some of the, even the over-the-counter, some of the medications that used to be by prescription, they could use as pain relievers. These are on an as-needed basis. Tylenol, the other name is acetaminophen. Naproxen is um, naproxen. Ibuprofen is Motrin. They all work to decrease inflammation. So if you are having acute pain, do not fly. Acute pain means something is causing the pain. If you are using it, uh, as a prophylaxis, if you have osteoarthritis and you take, uh, let's say, Tylenol every single day and you're not having any pain, that's fine. But you must report that if you're taking something chronically on your medical application. So let's talk about insomnia and inability to fall asleep. So sleep is really important to both the rest of the body and rejuvenate and re-energize the brain. How does it do that? We have absolutely no clue on how it works. We've been studying things for a long time. We still don't know. All we know is the nervous system needs to shut down to rest. The brain goes through cycles. There's a thing called deep sleep, and that's re-energization. REM sleep is where you're having your dreams, and that's actually to stimulate the brain, kind of wake it up, because most of us will be dreaming right near the end of our eight hours of rest, or in my case, six hours of rest. So I'm dreaming at five hours. We need our brain to be fresh before.
before we fly. So we need to be able to make decisions such as pre-flight, getting our weather, how long are the runways, what kind of weather, what's our density altitude. I do all that stuff. So if my brain wasn't functioning very well, I didn't have enough rest, I'm not a very good pilot and I'm doing myself a disservice by forcing myself to fly. Medications that we use for sleep, everybody seems to use Benadryl. It's the worst medication known to humankind for sleep. Ambien, we'll talk about Lunesta, Restoril, and Rosarum. These medications all work differently and should be only taken maybe one or two times a week. If you have to take it more than one or two times a week, you have an insomnia problem and you should, probably should not be flying. Benadryl, everybody knows about Benadryl. You'll see the other name is diphenhydramine. Huge amount of sedation. We even tell patients to take it every six hours if they have itching or have some kind of allergic side effect, poison ivy. It has a huge hangover effect. It, when you wake up in the morning after taking Benadryl, your mouth feels like the Sahara Desert. So what are you going to do? You're going to take a whole bunch of fluid. If you have a little bit of heart failure, all that fluid is going to back up and you can go into this thing called pulmonary edema where the water gets into your lungs and you have to be intubated. So look how long you have to wait if you take one dose of Benadryl. You should be not flying for 60 hours after the last dose. Last time I checked, that's about two and a half days. Ambien, it works on a receptor in the brain can control wakefulness and sleep. It causes people to sleep off. All of a sudden, these side effects from Ambien, they're saying, waking. I said, well, how can people gain weight while they're sleeping? What they were doing is they were sleepwalking to the refrigerator, eating all the food in the refrigerator, going back to sleep, getting on their scale in the morning, and they just gained two pounds. They couldn't figure it out. And so a little old pharmacist like myself kind of looked at said one of the side effects was sleepwalking. If you're a Kennedy, actually, they found one of the Kennedys sleep driving. He was in his pajamas driving down a street in Massachusetts. It also causes hallucinations, personality changes, and you must refrain from flying 24 hours after the last dose. Lunesta is a shorter acting Ambien, but you still must wait at least 30 hours after the last dose to fly. Restoril is kind of a shorter acting Valium. It has anti anxiety effects, it has amnesia effects. People don't remember who they are or where they are when they wake up off of Restoro. So we just use low doses, especially in the elderly. It also has muscle relaxing effects. So if you are not remembering what's happening, if you have muscle relaxing effects and you're going flying, that's a big deal. So you have to wait at least three days before after the last dose if you are taking Restoril for sleep. Rotterdam is actually a form of synthetic melatonin. It works on the sleep cycle, circadian rhythms. You must refrain from flying for 24 hours. There's a lot of melatonin out there for all you jet laggers that are going all across the world. And actually it's on my sleep protocol at the hospital. So melatonin is really good stuff, fast on and fast off. Some of the over-counter medications, these are medications that at one time were actually prescription. So that means you had to have a written order by a physician for these things and then they put it over the counter. So now you can go into any pharmacy and get these things. So they are also not without side effects and could hurt your performance airplane. So listen to this very carefully. One thing I want you to take away from this presentation is if the label says do not operate heavy machinery when taking, that also means an airplane. So that's very, very important to know. Even on prescription medications, it says do not operate while taking heavy machinery. Do not go flying. So some of the examples of the FAA safe OTCs, Tylenol, Motrin, Aleve, Claritin for allergies, very non-sedating. It's perfect. Allegra, actually, United Pilots were using it back in, I think it was somewhere around 1985. It was the first one that they used. Sudafed is actually something you use to dry up the nasal passages. It's pretty good. So don't worry about the pseudoephedrine because every time you go to the pharmacy, you have to write down your name and your driver's license, all that stuff. As long as you're not making any illicit drugs from it, you're doing just fine. So in 2013, there was a thing called the Pilot Protection Act. And this is the questions that I've been getting more than anything else over probably the last year. This is going to take away the third class medical as part of your certificate. You could still fly VFR. And it's based on the 10 years of experience that sport pilots have where they don't get a medical. They just use their driver's license. So that was started in the House of Representatives in March 10, 2014. The Senate introduced a companion bill. So 
really when you want to break down the pilots protection act 60,000 patients over the 60,000 pilots over the last 10 years have left because they can't have problems uh, getting their medical certificate there's absolutely no data over probably the 30 to 40 years of flight physicals that actually have said when you go get your medical and you get your flight physical that actually that has saved lives because you're going in there, you're doing your p-test, you're looking at the chart, you're doing all this stuff. It has never ever been shown that getting your medical actually has kept you safe. And so by having the sport pilots around, it showed that by not having a third class medical, it was okay and people do good. Now the thing is you still have to have your biannual flight review or your flight review every two years to evaluate. Now look at this very closely. The instructors will have added responsibility, so now I, I'm very comfortable with that. The instructors now will just evaluate your skills. They'll also evaluate your cognitive condition. So if you look ill, guess what? They can actually say, hey, look, this pilot is not safe to operate the aircraft. So what is really the bottom line is all you will need is a valid driver's license. You can't fly for hire. You only for VFR operations. What I think is going to change, I mean, They'll, they'll probably, after five years, when they show the data, it's safe to fly VFR. They'll probably also do the IFR pilots, but you got to fly below 14,000. I really, if ever, fly higher than 14,000 feet anyway. I fly in airplanes that don't fly any faster than usually 125 knots, so as long as you fly less than 250. And look at that, an aircraft that has no more than six seats, no more than 6,000 pounds. So in addition, what they did is then they shoved it over August 2nd, uh, April 2nd, 2014, over the FAA says, let's get this done. Let's start the process. Let's make this happen. So I think it's going to happen pretty soon. And here's the FAA when they said they formally were given over on April 2nd to say, let's make this happen. And it's really due to the big push by AOPA, and I'm proud to be a member of AOPA, and that really helped to get this thing moving because I think it's going to be a boon for us. We should not be losing pilots. We should be gaining pilots. It's such a wonderful, wonderful license that we have when we get to go places pe most people never, ever see. So if you're interested in getting more information, I mean, I can't present the 10,000 medications that I know in my head and the disease states. I published a book, as Jason uh, kind of like talked about in the beginning, and there's a picture of it. You know, I don't know. That's not a handsome devil, but you see I still, still have my bow tie on there. And I published the book. It's about 135 pages, and it's got a lot of disease states in there that all, in very, very simple terms, in which medications are safe. So I just kind of like made the AOPA and gave it some beef to it. So I uh, will start taking questions. And Jason, did you see anything that I can help people with? Yeah, so some great stuff, Larry. An awesome, awesome job. I'm going to uh, – got to go back to the beginning here and pull some of this stuff up. Oh, uh, uh, our buddy Tony B., uh, who we both met at Oshkosh, was asking about uh, Alka-Seltzer. Uh, I'm assuming he's talking about, um, you know, have a little bit of cold or something like that. Can we can we dive into that a little bit and kind of chat about it? Sure. Um, so actually, I was bringing this up. I had a great idea for uh, our patients that have what we call ST elevation, my complete occlusion of the coronary arteries. What actually is an alka seltzer originally was used for headaches. Why? Because there's 325 milligrams of aspirin and a little bit of sodium bicarbonate in it. So it's perfectly safe. Um, I probably would not take it every single day because it will cause some GI irritations. But really all it is is just aspirin with some fizziness to it. So it's kind of like an aspirin fizzy is uh, Alka-Seltzer. Cool. That's, That's plain alka -Seltzer. Yeah, great, great stuff. Um, guys, and then again, this is your time, guys. If you have your medical questions, concerns, uh, you can chime in via that handy dandy go to webinar control panel, ask your questions in here now, as well as if you're interested in grabbing a copy of Larry's book, it's available in the m0a.com store. Just click on uh, pilot shop on m0a.com, click on paperback books, and you can get that there. You can also go on Amazon. I'm sure if you search uh, Larry Diamond or the pilot's uh, primer for medications, you can find that there. Um, Let's see, a ton of questions coming in here, guys. So if I don't get to yours right away, no, I have it here, but I'm just working through it here. Um, let, let's see, uh, here's a great one. 
uh, from Matt. He said, uh, I'm an early student pilot now. Should I hold off on getting my physical? Larry, I know your answer, but I'd love to hear it from your own words. Um, uh, if you are like a new pilot and if, if there's something to be worried about or if you've had like a, oh, maybe a pediatric problem or an adolescent problem, there's always a way of working the FAA. Um, I always believe that, you know, people should go for their medicals. There's nothing to be worried about. Um, so, you know, I've gone through things from like kidney stones to color blindness, uh, people having surgery. So uh, if you want like more details, you can always like send me uh, either a, well, a text or an email at pilotlarry7 at gmail. I'll be more than happy to help you out. But I don't think you should have anything to worry about unless it's something dramatic like if you are antipsychotics or you're continually on Valium or if you're having seizures. So that's the only thing that would keep me from telling people not to get their hold off on the medical. Uh, I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. But I know the facts that you have uh, probably a 100% chance of getting your medical anyway. And uh, sometimes waiting for government agencies to really get things done. The FAA works slower than molasses. The government is even worse than that. So sometimes when they say it's going to happen really, really soon, if you have the passion to fly, Get your medical, and I would be more than happy to help you if there's a concern with any disease state or any medications. Cool. Okay, uh, Robert has a question, Larry. Uh, what about taking St. John's wort for mild depression? Okay. Um, so the thing is, is how who is diagnosed what mild is? Because we tend to kind of like not be the best physicians for ourselves. Or the best. So St. John's Wort actually works exactly like Prozac. And if you're only taking it maybe on an as-needed basis, and, and let's say you're taking it for just uh, like a few days, then it's absolutely fine. I mean, I wouldn't fly for probably at least uh, probably 72 to 48 hours, but I would be even more interested in why are you taking that and why are St. John's Wort, did someone suggest it? Because there's also a lot, a lot of drug interactions. That, uh, that people should be aware of. So St. John's Wort is just probably you know, maybe about 30% less than things like pros, and I kind of mentioned it at the very beginning. These are something that would actually require an, uh, an AME-assisted uh, kind of like waiver in order to do that, and you would have to like put it down if you were taking it continually. Cool. And, and again, guys, I'm a I'm, uh, ton of questions here. I'm probably uh, 10 or 15 questions away from actually catching up here. So uh, if I haven't gotten your question just yet, again, we're going to get to it here in a second. Just working down the line here. Joseph has a great question. Larry, I know you're going to laugh. You know I'm no um, Stanford graduate by any means to pronounce half of these uh, crazy uh uh, drug names, but here's the question. It says, Larry, I take as needed Trexamet, T-R-E-X-I-M-E-T. I'm sure you know what that is, Larry, uh, as needed for headaches. I'm a 62-year-old student pilot. The FAA approved a special issuance of a third-class medical for one year based upon a report from my doctor. However, I must again provide additional information in July of 2015 after another report from my doctor. What information and or advice can you give me? At the time of my FA physical, I was also taking Trazadone, T-R-A-Z-A-Done, uh, as a prescription sleep aid, but have not taken it for over six months. Okay. So um, if you are not going to take it, uh, if you're going to take it, if you plan on taking it, you have to report it. Now, trazodone, actually, we use that as actually an antidepressant. And I'm pretty sure it's not on the safe FAA medication list. So if you can think of the most conservative people in the whole wide world, think of the FAA. So anything that even though it's being used for sleep and not using as an antidepressant, you're probably going to have to, eat to have, you have to be off of it for, I think it's at least 60 to 90 days before you go for your physical, then you're fine. If you at some time need to take it on a continual basis, then you'll have to report it. And I'll almost guarantee it, they're going to hold your medical certificate, and it's probably going to take anywhere between 6 to 12 months to get it all kind of sorted out. So in that case, I would think of alternatives, you know, such as warm milk, chamomile tea, 
uh, back rub from your wife, boyfriend, or girlfriend. You know, all you know, all this other stuff. But use more natural type of things. Trazodone is actually something we use in the hospital as part of our sleep protocol. So uh, it would be something that you would probably have a problem with if you put that down on your medical. And I'm always trying to be safe because if you try and hide something, sometimes it's going to you know bite you in the butt and it's going to come back and someone's going to say something. Or if you've had maybe your physician has to send reports into the FAA concerning like sleep apnea or something like that, you're going to have it listed as all the medications. So. Uh, uh, you know, that one is kind of like is probably something that I would probably have to either say stop taking or going to have to report it and go through all the hoops. Cool. Great. And great advice too, Larry. It's a great example when you share, you know, you're dealing with the most conservative people possible, no matter, even if you're taking it for this reason, that's just a great example, I believe. Hey, um, Larry, uh, Chame asked, uh, can we talk about uh, like ADD, ADHD type stuff? Yeah, um, I've had actually a couple questions on that, and uh, what it is is uh, concerning those medications. You'll see it if you pull up that uh, the AOPA FAA safe medication list. You'll see none of those are on there. So it's uh, usually it's going to be have to be a special issuance, and usually if you're an older adult, you'll be on something that's very amphetamine-like uh, medication like Adderall and uh, things like that. So it's going to create a, a lot of work and you actually uh, may have to like hold off on your pilot certificate for a few months if not even greater than maybe six to nine months in order to get that all taken care of. Um, usually they'd like you to be not on any of those medications but there's always a way around it but you know I would say 99.99% .99 of the time it would be considered a unsafe FAA medication. Great. Um, a lot of questions. Ken Scott talking about hypothyroidism. Um, yeah. Someone asking about is it is it synth thyroid or synthroid? Yeah. Um, right. It's levothyroxine. Yeah. Okay. It's part of the T3 T4. Yeah. It, it'll it'll be uh, for a special issuance, and those are all things that your AME could actually help you with. So as long as you, okay, I'll be talking specifically just to the people taking Synthroid. You're going to have to get your thyroid stimulating hormone done on a regular basis. You're going to have to have your T3 and T4, which is, these are the hormones that are normally produced in the thyroid. And as long as uh, your physician sends those reports into the FAA and also your medical examiner, you're going to be okay. But it is a special issuance. It's not 40 years on Synthroid for Ken. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that. Again, some of them are kind of coming. I'm trying to put uh, the pictures uh, together here. Um, yeah, this, I, there's I one saw, here I'm great about uh, Siltalopram. Yeah, I, I see. I know I see Michael talked about sleep apnea. Someone else mentioned um, sleep apnea too. Could we just – kind of give a gosh there's just so I'm like I got a full 27 inch monitor and every single space of it is filled with questions here. I'm just trying to put everything together here so Michael's asking about sleep apnea um, you know controlled via a CPAP anything he needs to worry about uh, certainly we need to talk about that one Larry um, and there was another one while you're talking about that I'll bring it up and and I'm sure you'll be able to tie them all in together here yeah, and so I'm going to also pull up, there was a couple questions on which of those SSRIs that could be used for uh, for uh, depression. Here, I saw a couple of them, Siltalopram, and was one of them here. So let me, I'll pull up that slide again so they can look to see, you know, which one is on there that it's okie dokie here. Uh, I think it was at the very beginning. Oh, on stage here. So there are the four SSRIs. I don't know if you can see my screen. So it's Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, and Lexapro. So Telepram is, uh, I think it's uh, Lexapro. And so that is Nokie Dokie, and you can get your special issuance for that. Okay, okay well, let's uh, talk about uh, sleep apnea. So I've had actually two students with sleep apnea, and they've, they've had uh, the CPAP machine. And what they do is they have to get a sleep study. So, you know, all of a sudden, what was it? I think it was, what, back in February or March when we did our little uh, radio show about that? It was much ado about 
nothing. There's never ever been any kind of adverse events with people who have sleep apnea. And these are people with BMI is greater than 40. So these are pretty hefty people. We're talking about 280 pounds and over. And what happens is they're also, their soft palate gets big because they're big people. So when they lie down, the soft palate pushes up against their trachea and then they actually stop breathing anywhere between 50 to 100 times. So what you do is you get a sleep study and then they get put on this BiPAP machine which actually is a machine that forces the air in. So think of yourself as sticking your head out the window when you're driving your car and that's positive air pressure that's being forced into the lungs and that's the machine that you use while you're sleeping. And so as long as you keep up and send those reports into the medical examiner, it's peachy keen and hunky dory. Um, the only time that the FAA made a big deal about it is because three pilots, uh, I think they were doing an approach into like Portland or something like that, two of them actually fell asleep there at the helm, the other one I think was probably taking a nap, and they ended up over the ocean and they ended up coming in and they kind of looked at it, and one of them was a little bit obese, and they ended up getting sleep apnea, so then they went crazy. So one person it kind of ruins it for the millions and millions of pilots that are all over the world. So the sleep apnea thing was way overblown, and you can fly with sleep apnea. Cool. Um, Larry, I'm going I'm to throw one your way. Um, if you look at Jay's, um, at, uh, it came in at 841. If you can scroll like via time, uh, he says, Larry, are these meds and numbers okay to fly? And kind of gives a long list of stuff. I'll let you, can you, did you find that one? Or let me give you a second to find it here. Yeah, you said 841, and it was by who? By J. Yeah, J -A -Y. J -A -Y. Oh, I see. J. Jacobs? Yep. Okay. So did he list the meds? I don't see the like the meds on there. Yeah, if you click, uh, if you actually click on it, then uh, down at the bottom it says because he kind of spaced oh, them out. Yeah. See it? I'll go right to the front. You know, I've been answering these questions for so long. I should know this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So Coreg is fine. That's a beta blocker. Invokana is not on the list yet for the FAA. So if you could change that like over to like Genuvia. That would be peachy keen and hunky dory. So you see that carvedilol? That actually is exactly the same thing as Coreg. That's what I tell people all the time. We in medicine, we screw people up because we give two names to it. We give like a trade name. And uh, actually, that's one of my favorite beta blockers. I call it my blueberry beta blocker. And because it has antioxidant effect, so I get all my diabetics on it. And it actually helps with their diabetes control. Crestnor is not on the safe list yet. But if you can get, there's one called a Torvastatin, which is Lipitor. And that one, if you have any mice in your areas, and uh, I'm out here in northern Michigan, you can actually go to the Meyer Pharmacy and get it for free. So that's how I save a lot of the patients' money. So Crestor, I don't think it's on there yet, because I know there's ones like Simvastatin, a Torvastatin, I think uh, when a Pravacol, Pravastatin is on there. So if you go for your flight physical, you would have to change the Invokana to like Genuvia and the Crestor over to a Torvastatin and then everything should be peachy. Cool. And and Larry, if you could just scroll down one question from Jay to um, um, Ron uh, has a question specifically for you too. Uh, AFib, yeah, that's the one I go around the country talking about all the new anticoagulants. Okay, so for the third class medical, so here's what it is. So for atrial fibrillation, it's like a dysfunctional family. Only dysfunction, it's like the kids after Halloween. What happens when the kids eat all the candy? They kind of run around a lot. So these these little uh, pacemakers that are inside the upper part of our heart. So we have atrium and a ventricle, and so the blood goes from the top part of the heart to the bottom part. So what happens is anytime you stretch the atrium, all these little pacemakers go off, and it's going at like 600 beats per minute, and then only 150 goes down to the vent. So what you'd have to do is you have to rate control people. We just keep your heart rate between uh, somewhere between 60 and 100. And then the other thing is they have to be on anticoagulation. So what happens is it gets turbulent up there, and then the clot goes into what I call this little atrial garage. And so if the patients will go from that atrial fibrillation it, in the, to a normal sinus rhythm, it may shoot out that clot and could cause a stroke. So there are a couple of the anticoagulants that are okay to be on, and all the rate controllers are all safe for the FAA. So the reason why AFib is like so important 
and to control is okay so yeah what medications are okay so warfarin is good there's a medication called Xarelto or Rivaroxaban. I go around the country talking about that. You don't have to monitor it. Actually, I got two pilots within 24 hours after it became safe up into both United and Delta. They were both into atrial fibrillation. And these are people who are getting their first class medical. So third class medical is pretty easy. So those are the two anticoagulants that you can be on according to the FAA. And all the rate controllers are also safe for uh, for pilots to be on, and I can give you a whole list of those too. But all the ones that you're concerned about are okay. Great, and and, and Larry, I'm, I'm just great answer. I'm just kind of digging through these. Even if you scroll down just a few um, after Ron, uh, look at Raj, and then after that, uh, John from Massachusetts. Two really uh, uh, good questions. Okay. Raj is close to the, the AFib one. Let's see here. Raj is, uh, they're all still 841. A bunch just came. I mean, we're still answering questions that came in at 841. We're, we're quite a little bit behind, guys. So just give us, I promise we'll get to your question here. Just working through them here. You, you see Raj? Yep. Yeah. Uh, inflammation of the joint that causes pain now. Perform some intense activities. Uh, so a uh, first class medical, so what would be okay for that? Um, if it's kind of like an osteoarthritic, if it's inflamed, then uh, things like ibuprofen or Motrin are fine. Naproxen is absolutely fine. And uh, those are all will decrease inflammation. When you take them chronically, you have to make sure that you have it with food because what it does is it causes GI irritation, which then leads to a GI bleed. So always take it with food. Um, naproxen works just as well as uh, like ibuprofen and that's fine and also you have to watch your kidneys if you take it for like a couple years so those that's the only thing so those are all on the FAA uh, safe approved list and uh, so number one I'd like to know why are you keep having problems with that and also there may be a need to actually see like an orthopod to make sure that it's not something chronic that's going to actually keep you from walking around Okay, so what was the other one? Uh, it's just right underneath his. Take a look at John from Massachusetts. Okay, so the question was concerning Paxil. Why is it on the list? And I said exactly the same thing because actually Paxil has better data than Lexapro. And it is. So uh, what it is is whoever was doing the research concerning these four, either like a has very little experience with all the other ones. Um, so, you know, the Prozac and the Zoloft, and actually third on my list is always Paxil, but it didn't make the list only because it didn't have enough data for the FAA to feel safe with. So that's the only reason why. So if it was me, I would actually take off Selexa and Lexapro off of that and add on Paxil into it and keep those as, like, at least my three. That's just my own personal bias since I look at these data all the time. So... Uh, that was just something that happened due to like random chance in the FAA. Cool. Uh, Larry, Kyle asked the million dollar question too. I know a lot of people have. He said, I heard that you can be partially colorblind and still fly VFR day. Is this true? Also, a, a bunch of people asking about um, if you know the uh, uh, eyesight tolerances, can I fly with glasses? So let's kind of focus on eye stuff here for a second if we could. Absolutely. So can you fly with glasses? Absolutely. Contact lenses? Absolutely. The only time that really the FAA has kind of gotten a little crazy is with like monovision, which what that means when you get LASIK surgery, when your eye is for fire and one eye is near. And so you'll probably see about 80% of all the pilots that are greater than probably 50 years old all have reading glasses. So if you wanted to ever get LASIK surgery, you can get it for uh, your nearsightedness and then wear reading glasses. Or you can just wear glasses, that's fine. Uh, even the airlines have gotten a lot better. They're now allowing a lot more actually vision uh, deficient people. Uh, I don't really mean that as like blindness or anything like that. But yeah, you can wear contacts, you can wear glasses, everything is fine. So as long as you read the chart in your 2020, and I'll always say on your little medical, they corrected. So that's fine, it says that on everything. So uh, yeah, that's, that's just peachy. So you can get LASIK surgery, you can actually get a soda for that, a special uh, 
kind of thing that you have to send over to, I think it's Oklahoma City in order to get it. You can actually still even fly with LASIK surgery. So that, that's not a big deal. But like everybody does is, like I said, the FAA is very, very slow in the uptake. LASIK surgery has been around for over 20 years now. And this is about how long it's been taking to finally them to feel comfortable with it. So uh, that's, you know, that's the whole deal. So colorblindness, I have had yeah, two students that are colorblind. And uh, for me, it was easy. So they were having problems with reds and greens. Well, when you think about flying, you know, our lights on the side of our wings are red and green. If you look at a sectional map, they're red and green. And so what I did is actually I flew him over to the FAA FISDO that's only like about 10 miles away. It took us like five minutes to fly over to Willow Run. And uh, what I did is I called up the FAA and then I called up the tower and I said, could you flash us the red and the green and the white? Don't tell us, you know, don't tell me ahead of time. And uh, he just did it. The FAA was there. We taxi and we did fine. And he did not have his colorblind uh, problem. You can get another thing. It's called an OCT. Um, there's a different kind of, you know, when you read those little, you know, little bubbles or dots or whatever, they're called the Ishihara test. And uh, what there is is you can do different kinds. There's kind of like the Farnsworth slat uh, lamp that you can use instead. And then you can also actually take a test. And what you'll need to do, especially for the night part of it, you actually have to go into a cockpit. It has to be dark. You have to be in with an FAA guy. And then you just have to read the screens, and there's like zero tolerance. So you can't get like one wrong out of ten. So you got to get them all right. And then once you do that, then you're okay to fly, even though you may be diagnosed with colorblindness, but if you pass the test, you're good to go. Great. Um, a lot of people, I say a lot, two or three people, uh, Mark's one of them. Um, there's just so many names popping up, quite a few. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce this one, Larry. And again, I don't know, Larry, I don't know who's in charge of naming some of these things, but I can, you know, it's like they just throw a bunch of random letters together naming some of these drugs. Um, uh, this one is, is uh, Lisineral Pill, L-I-S-I-N-O-Pril, <laughs> P-R-I-L. No one's talking about it, am I crazy? Yeah, so that, that's an ACE inhibitor. It, uh, it does everything but keep your mother-in-law away, so it decreases your hypertension, it decreases your risk for stroke, it decreases your risk for having a heart attack, so that's why I call it something that probably should be in the water supply. Um, side effects are a little bit of hyperkalemia, a little high potassium, so when you're on that, um, you, the, the physician will check every year your potassium level. You don't want it too high because it causes an increase in potassium, so you want to make sure it's okay. The other thing, it causes a dry tickle cough, and so what I do is I just switch it over to a different ACE inhibitor. But that's actually one of my favorites. It's a once-a-day dose. People are compliant with it, and it works fantastic. Um, so there was a question about the maximum pressure for the second class. It's still the same thing. It's 155 over 95. So if you're below on your readings, less than 155 or 95, you're good to go, and you can be on lisinopril. It works really well. I think David asked that question. There's a couple. Oh, Mark asked also about lisinopril. Yeah, I, I see that. And again, if you if you see any of these you want to uh, uh, dive into, feel free to. Uh, there's a great one from our uh, uh, friend, uh, grounds member Tanya. Uh, Tanya said, can you give a recommendation if you sometimes get motion sickness while flying? But of course, we don't want to cause drowsiness. Okay. Ginger. I do this all the time for all the people that have uh, motion sickness and usually they'll say well I can't do it so what I did there was a, a patch that came out it was called a transco patch it had scopolamine in it so what's kind of neat about the body if you give them something that's going to make them dizzy it actually stops the dizziness it kind of reharmonizes the middle ear and so it was, it was releasing a whole bunch or was not releasing it at all so I switched everybody over to ginger. It's a 200 milligram. You can take to ginger tea like an hour before you go, or you take a 200 milligram capsule. You can get it at a health food store. Make sure it's real ginger. So if you taste it, it doesn't taste like ginger ale. It tastes is kind of like if you go to a restaurant, and it's kind of like if you go for sushi. That pink stuff is actually ginger. That's pickled a little bit. 200 milligrams of ginger before stops motion sickness. So that's my organic way of stopping motion sickness. Great. Uh, Actually, I used 
Yeah, you said people with hyperemesis gravidarian, those are people that are pregnant, they can't keep anything down, and so it helped with nausea and vomiting, it also helps with motion sickness. Awesome. Uh, question from our good friend, uh, Hilaria asked, um, I'd like to know uh, if a person with controlled gout would be able to pass a third class medical. Um, yeah, I think allopurinol is usually the medication that they use that's on there. And I'm pretty sure I could probably have to pull up my book. But uh, yeah, gout is, as long as you're not having these, what we call gouty attacks, and you have to be on colchicine, and you become very inflamed. But uh, yeah, gout is something that can be controlled, and I've had a lot of patients that are on anti-gout medications that do just peachy. But what I can do, if uh, you can leave your email address, I'll make absolutely sure to look that one up for you, because I don't want to give you any wrong information. Sure. I, I can give you a uh, hilarious email there. She's a good friend uh, and certainly long time, long time fan of M0A.com. Um, uh, Paul asked, you, you mentioned about reporting anything and everything kind of on that medical. Uh, should we report vitamins? You're taking a multivitamin, anything like that, Larry? Absolutely not. Uh, uh, let me just ask that person who's taking the vitamins. Uh, do you eat well? Um, I was just talking to a whole bunch of little old ladies at a church last night. And I was freezing my bookie off while I was doing it. And uh, they asked me the same thing. I said, how many people in this room, and these are people that are 75 or over, the old ladies, they just love Uncle Larry. So they, every single one of them was taking vitamins. And if you are eating the good Mediterranean diet, and if you're eating well, Taking vitamins is a waste of time and a waste of money. You end up peeing out all the vitamin C, all the vitamin E, all the vitamin A. So if you are eating a healthy diet, save your money. Do not take vitamins and contribute it towards your gas money for your flying. So you do, you don't have to, you know, I wouldn't, it's just uh, like a supplement. It's like eating. So, no, you don't have to report a vitamin. Cool. Um, Mike asked a question. I uh, wanted to know about having a defibrillator implant. Ah, see, that's one you have to really, really work at the FAA. You'll notice that it's actually one of the things that you can't be on and get your medical. Um, the, uh, you know, recently, I actually think I've seen a couple of heart transplants that have gotten their medical. I mean, you can't go above a third class. But that would be something you'd have to, I would call my AME and, uh, you know, kind of like your AMEs are out there actually f to help you. So even before you go to medical, you can say, hey, look, I have this, 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 and this. What do you suggest that I do before I even come to see you? And most of the people don't even know that. And that a lot of times I'll say, hey, look, even though you're across the country, I'll give them my AME person. And he'll answer those questions and say, okay, this is a process you need to do because that's what they do for a living. So before I make any recommendations. So a defibrillator is really a shock box. And it sits there. And what it does is it recognizes if you have a really fast heart rate. And if it's like over, let's say, 160 beats per minute, it gives you a 20 joule shock right on your heart. So that is something that's very, very complicated. Knowing the FAA the way I do, they're going to, as I say, freak out if they're going to say, hey, look, I have a defibrillator. But there are processes that you can do. You know, you get your, like, EP doc, which is your, your electrophysiology doc. You get your primary care physician. You then call your AME and say, what do I need to do in order to get my medical? I know it's only going to be a third class. And then go through that process. Because you don't want to cut any corners when it comes to something like that. Because the FAA is going to worry that you're going to be up there flying and your defibrillator is going to go off because you go into ventricular tachycardia, which means you are dead. So uh, that's going to really, really uh, almost want them to have a diaper in their pants because they're going to freak out when they see that. Cool. How about uh, Dennis asked, um, what about meds uh, he could take with uh, COPD and fly? Yeah, all the uh, all the ones that are out there, um, the inhalers. Um, uh, I think most of them are approved, and that's all uh, fine. And usually, what they do is they're taking these like anticholinergic medications, and they're taking it internally. The other thing that they're going to probably ask is when did you have, have like any really bad attacks? Because COPD or sometimes have an increased risk of having pneumonia. 
and things like that. So it'll depend on how bad the COPD is. But actually, there's a chapter in my book uh, that talks about the specific, all the specific COPD that are safe. So, um, you know, uh, if you want to give like nine bucks to Mrs. Diamond, and it'll be worth your while to like uh, read that chapter, and it's really, really cool, and uh, it'll kind of help you out and show you exactly the path that you can go in order to get your medical. Beautiful. Keep it. Beautiful. And of course, all that is available on Amazon.com or on the uh, M0A.com pilot shop. You guys can check out Larry's book there. A lot of questions regarding the Pilot Protection Act, but let me give you the context a little bit, Larry. Uh, Greg, who I know you've chatted with many times on our Monday night webinars, uh, says if you currently have a special issuance uh, and they do away with a third class medical requirement, do you just keep flying with your driver's license? Another one, uh, Leon said uh, many years ago as a student pilot, I had my third class revoked because of meditation. Uh, Medications I was taking for migraine headaches. Stopped my lessons, haven't flown since. Recently was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, taking three oral medica medications. If the FAA stops issuing the third class medical, will I be able to get my uh, certificate? So just kind of general, you know, geez, maybe I have a medical, maybe I have this issue. What's going to happen if we do get rid of the third class medical, Larry? Um, so in that case, what you're going to do, as long as you're flying VFR and you're physically fit, to fly now, you know, physically fit. Now, what does that mean? So, if you are having symptoms and stuff like that, you're not physically fit to fly. If you are doing just fine, you're seeing your physician every year. The answer is yes. So, uh, you know, it's it's going to be an increase, as I say, uh, of diligence by the instructors when they every two years when you do your flight review. But it's going to be back to the I am safe checklist. That's why I kind of pound the I am safe checklist on all my students. So that's going to be then your responsibility saying, am I safe to fly? Because you think about it, I mean, you're going to be taking passengers. These are your loved ones. These are your friends. Um, so you are also saying, okay, am I fit to fly? Am I fit to fly to carry my passengers? So whenever I found anytime you self-empower a pilot or anybody that's out there, they tend to actually be even more conservative probably than the FAA or even your physician is going to do. So it's going to be one of those, am I responsible to myself and am I making the right decision and is this the right thing to do? So that's going to force you to do, do a lot of self-evaluation. So if you are physically fit to operate that airplane according to, you know, you won't have a certificate, but according to the skills needed in order to complete that mission or that flight in a safe manner, the answer is yes. I mean, you will be able to fly without the third class medical and your driver's license. But you also got to remember it's going to put a lot more responsibility on your decision to make this. So what they found out is through the sport pilot, they're flying you know, not as high horsepower airplanes that are a little bit smaller, that even having the driver's license, even the people uh, there, they found they were safe because I think they were actually doing their due diligence and saying to yourself, am I fit to fly today? Because now it's my decision and my responsibility. You don't want to hurt people. You don't want to hurt yourself. You want to live to fly another day. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, as long as you're not having any major illnesses. Absolutely. And I, and I can already see the follow-up questions. And Tony C. asked this, you know, what's really the status uh, on this whole getting rid of the third class medical thing, Pilot Protection Act type stuff? So um, the status is, well, it's it's two government agencies, you know, working with one another. Um, it, it's tough. Of course, they said, oh, it will be done in 2014. Of course, now they say, oh, it'll be done in 2015. And it's just like Larry said, it's government. It moves slow as molasses. Um, they say it's coming. Um, you know, I'm not saying I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, I, I think it'll happen, um, but I could still see it going either way. Uh, but that is certainly something they're, uh, they're working towards. I know AOPA is pushing uh, very hard, uh, but they don't have a time frame. Their time frame right now is just 2015. Of course, their time frame last year was just 2014. So we'll see what happens. Um, let's see. I, Larry, do you see anything that catches your eye here? If not, I have a... Uh, a few so others, if you're ready for them. There was a question on glucosamine and chondroitin, and the uh, the answer to that is, so if you're going to be taking glucosamine and chondroitin, the first thing, manual I want you to do is do not, so don't you ever use chondroitin. All that is is 
Char cartilage is a waste of your money and makes it more expensive. If you're going to use glucosamine on a regular basis, you're going to have to report it uh, if you're going to get a third class medical. If we get now the Pilots Protection Act, you will not. And glucosamine actually works just as good as ibuprofen. I've had tons of patients on it, but you can't be allergic to marine exoskeletons, which means you're not allergic to shellfish. That's the only thing I, want, I wanted to kind of like add to that. Uh, let's see, there was another one. Someone asked about Cialis and Viagra, which is a great question because, you know, I know everything about that. They have great commercials and all this other stuff. And uh, so what it is is you're probably going to have to wait at least 24 hours after flying because what that does is it actually lowers the blood pressure. And actually one dose of, like, Viagra actually stays in the body for about 36 hours. So I would probably wait 48 hours after using Cialis or Viagra. Uh, there was another one here. I take a tenolol and Nexium and uh, had sinus surgery in March. And uh, those are both medications that work that are on the FAA safe list. And uh, let's see here. And he had to send in his last EKG. So the reason why is is because some of these medications will actually are being used for like arrhythmia such as like AFib and slow it down. So they probably uh, are looking for uh, some kind of EKG verification that says that everything is right and you're not bradycardic, which means your heart rate is too low, which then will increase your risk for having like a syncopal episode or having a fall. Let's see what else. Larry, I saw, uh, not, to, not to cut off your flow here, is a good one from Tommy. Um, he takes uh, is it uh, Lotrel for hypertension and and Flomax for BPH. Do you foresee any issues getting a third class medical for Tommy? Um, I do not. Uh, Lotrel actually is a combination product, and uh, so both of those things that are kind of in there are both on the FAA safe list. At least the last time I looked, I don't think they made any changes to it. And Flomax is used for BPH. Actually, it's one of the best ones around. Okay. Um, here's one right up your alley, uh, Larry, because we talk about this uh, brain health uh, quite a bit. Uh, Joe said, my mother and two of her female siblings have a history of dementia. Is there any medication you would recommend for long-term memory health? Uh, something for a man who's currently showing no signs of memory loss, but who flies is concerned about the future. Uh, you know, we've talked about this, you know, multiple times. Uh, and uh, actually, there is stuff out there. And uh, if you can give that person my email address, because I didn't want to create that, you know. You know, everybody knows that, you know, we're trying to do everything we possibly can. So there are some supplements out there that actually will work. And, uh, well, for dementia, you know, the thing about it is, is we have absolutely no idea on what causes dementia. And the one thing that I do know about it is the, okay, there it is, perfect. Um, so the one thing that we do know is it's uh, probably due to brain inactivity, and it also could be genetic because they, they just did some new studies on that. So there'd be no way to actually to uh, you know, predict it until it happens. But what it is, if we keep ourselves active, keep our brains active, and do exercise, it actually decreases your risk for dementia unless you have some kind of overwhelming genetic predisposition for it. Uh, David asked, a, sorry to cut you off there, Larry. David asked a great question right after that. Just a good, uh, hi, Larry. Thanks for the presentation. I'm 52 years old. Have not, not flown for many years looking to get back into flying. I'm in good health. Is there any more to get in a medical to someone who's, you know, after 50? No, I mean, I think 50 is the new 35 because I'm 62 and I think that's the new 50. So uh, as long as you're eating right and exercising, everything is just fantastic. Cool. That's, uh, that is great, great stuff here. Um, and again, just if you see something great, chime in. Uh, our buddy Greg, you probably remember Greg from many ground school webinars, asked about Lipitor. He says, drives a semi for a living, never any issues getting a CDL. Uh, thoughts on Lipitor and an FAA medical, Larry? Okay, I, I take Lipitor too, and I think it's one of the best ones out there. It actually decreases triglycerides, has the most fantastic uh, heart attack data. That every single one of the patients that get what we call stents being put in is, uh, and I put together the order set for that, is on, on Lipitor. 
and that's our uh, drug of choice. It's our, on our hospital formulary. And like I said, there actually is some pharmacies where you can get it for free. And uh, I, th I think it's beautiful, and it's kept me with uh, very, very low LDLs, and, and I feel fantastic. It also has some anti-inflammatory effects. So that is, to me, my favorite one to be on, and it's actually also on the FAA safe list. All right. Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, coming in at 8.59 and 9 p.m., there's a good one from uh, Michael. If you saw that one, Larry. Um, okay. I'm trying to read through a few it. other ones here. A lot of them are just good, positive comments. Let's okay, see. so the question was uh, PSVT, which is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and VTAX. Started on a beta blocker because it has antiarrhythmic effects. However, after the cardiac MRI showed that, uh, let's see, got it in compaction, which now they're wanting to do a defibrillator implant as they can. What do I need to do to continue flying? Okay, so number one, you need to take care of yourself first. I want you to get healthy. And then after that, everything is healthy and everything is where it should be. It's what I call euboxic. You know, all your labs and everything else are in the normal box. And then what we can do is you can, then after all this is taken care of, then uh, let me know how everything is going. What I think is going to have to happen, you're probably going to have to call your AME and uh, say, okay, what do I need to do? This is what I got. What do I have EKGs? You'll have to have, probably have your cardiac MRI um, and things like that. And then once you get a clean bill of health, then you're going to have to go through a few hoops with the FAA. But I want you to take care of yourself first, and then we can go concerning the flying. Great, great tips. Um, Tom shared Tom shared this at the very beginning, too. I'm sorry, I'm just now getting this, Tom. Um, this is a good question, too. I don't really quite know the answer. Is there a way to see a, a last medical form he submitted? He said, as a kid, I was diagnosed with a heart murmur. Uh, but, um, you know, never been a bother to him. He's 54 now, a recent pilot. Um, but is there a way for him to go back and see, you know, last year's medical from two years ago or whatever, you know, that may be? Larry, do you know that answer offhand? Um, what it is, is, at least with my guy, I mean, that's the only experience I've ever had for the last 30 years. I've actually had two AMAs, and the one that uh, passed away just sold his what it is before he retired, he sold his practice to the guy we see now. And I have all mine. Actually, they're all online. Everything is done online, and I can go. I even showed you like one of mine that I had. I didn't put it on like the presentation, but I have all mine. I've saved them all, and uh, you can go back to your AME, and I'm sure they have them on file also. All you have to do is ask. They're yours. So uh, yeah, that's how I've always done it. I, I got copies of mine. Certainly. And I was thinking too, I mean, with, with med express and everything else too, going so digital now, I mean, it's not going to help you, you know, Tom now, but in the future, it's certainly, you'll be able to go back and check out all that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm just kind oh, of absolutely. picking, picking through these here, Larry holler. If you see anything else you like here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, let's see. Selexa was horrible for me. Uh, David asked about that. And I said, I totally agree. So that's why, you know, I have a lot of disagreements with the FAA, but they're a lot bigger than my 5'4", 130-pound body. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I Sometimes the greasy wheel, you know, uh, sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so I'm very squeaky. I send a lot of stuff to the FAA all the time. And uh, I use Jason's name, of course. No, I, no, not really. I use mine. But I send them, all I do is I send them data. So I think a couple of the, those, especially those antidepressant medications, could be completely changed. And I totally agree. Uh, yeah, so David mentioned something about Selexa, and I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I see um, uh, Tony asked, how do you get to the M0A Pilot Shop? Tony, on M0A.com, in that top nav bar, you'll see Pilot Shop. I believe is what it says. From there, it'll take you to three options. Click on paperback books. And then from there, you'll see uh, Uncle Larry's book in there. You can also search Larry Diamond on Amazon. Uh, I'm sure you could find it that way. Tim has a question for you, Larry. What about restless leg syndrome and any medication for that? Yeah, unfortunately, there's nothing on the FAA safe list for that. Um, there's actually, uh, if you go into Google, 
and put in herbal products for restless leg syndrome, you'll see a couple that are on there. You know, I don't want to like do an advertisement for one, but trust me, go on to that and you're going to see there's actually a couple some really, really good kind of herbal products for that too. And if you have to take it every single day, you're going to have to put it on your medical. Um, if once the Pilot Protection Act comes through and you're only flying VFR in less than 14,000 feet, then it won't be a problem. But up until that time, which I don't know when it's going to happen, um, that's what you would do because all we use Requip and stuff like that, and I'm almost positive that's not on the FAA safe list because, you know, again, they're very conservative. They're not going to go out to, you know, use some of these. Actually, that's an anti-Parkinson medication. So the last thing you're going to think about, they're going to see that, oh, yeah, that's indicated for Parkinson's. Well, if you've ever seen someone with Parkinson's disease, they get frozen and they walk funny. And there's like no way that they're going to give a medical when they see that medication. Stuff. Uh, well, guys, we are kind of getting to the end of questions. So if I have not answered or Larry has not answered your question, it's very possible I missed it. The next question I see is from Gino. Uh, and after that, I don't see a whole lot. So uh, again, we Larry can attest to it. There's a ton of stuff here. So if I missed you, please copy and paste it and post it again because I missed it and I'm very sorry, but I want to get your question answered. So uh, do that here. Gino asked, by the way, Larry, I don't even, this is, again, these, these drug names kill me. Um, uh, okay. load. Yeah, that's what I, I was trying it. to say. How about that, Larry? So when you look at the slide uh, on hypertension, that's Norvask. So that's fine. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Actually, it's one of the, we use that all the time. It's a vasodilator. Cause it increased in the amount of blood that's carrying oxygen and it's great for hypertension. Cool. Um, Willie asked, um, um, why do um, the, his question is why does the uh, the examiner want to know about hospital visits or if you've been hospitalized? You know what he's talking about there, Larry? Yeah. So anytime you go to the hospital, usually it's due to something. So let's say you had pneumonia. They want to know why. Did you have a you know COP exas exacerbation and you got short of breath? They want to know that. Uh, so you know anytime you have a procedure. So if you had like a kidney stone, they want to know okay when was the last time you do? Because in their mind, I've known people that have kidney stones. They think everybody is going to be on like morphine or something like that and go flying because they had one pilot that had a kidney stone, took morphine with his family hit a side of a hill, and then landed upside down. So that's going to ruin it for every single other person that has kidney stones. But you can still get your medical, as we all know, with kidney stones. So that's all they're looking for because they think if you go to the hospital, you were very sick or you had some kind of procedure, and they want to know about it. And that's the reason why you have to put all hospitalizations down on your medical. Uh, next one down from that, Joseph, uh, asking if you could discuss briefly uh, Treximet. Okay, so where is that question? Uh, right me? underneath, oh. I'm sorry, right underneath Willie's uh, 9.28 uh, p.m. is when that one came in. Okay, 9.28, Willie, okay, here it is. Right under Willie's. Treximet, okay, so that's a generic. Uh, let me uh, make sure that... Uh, I'm going to go into my Google. So see if there's any other questions while I kind of look this one up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, Jay asks, can you review again uh, what one can do in terms of reviewing their medical situation with an aviation doc before going into this e exam? Um, obviously, you want to have all your ducks in a row before you go in there, Jay. I think that's a, that's a wonderful idea. Uh, again, for those of you who – who have a, you've got a medical coming up. My my number one resource for you, and that's why I, I share with you the power of world famous Uncle Larry, uh, is that despite being a crazy busy guy, he's there to help you. So Jay, what I would do is I'd email Larry. He shares his email, his personal email just uh, publicly. It's just pilotlarry7 at gmail.com. Pilotlarry7 at gmail.com. Just shoot Larry an email, so Larry, I've got my and and let's not let's not 
wait till the last minute. Let's not say, Larry, I got my medical next week and here's my issue. Because a lot of times when you need to be off these medications, the FAA wants to see you off in 30, 60, 90 days in some case. So let's give you know quite a bit of heads up because if it's something the FAA is going to want you off 90 days, you're going to need to do your homework ahead of time. So if you have a concern, I hope you ask your question here. Or I hope that you'll find time to email Larry again, pilotlarry7 um, at gmail.com is where I would go with that. Uh, Larry, anything else you want to add to that or, or anything else here? For Joseph, um, what it is is it's a combination of sumotriptan, which is used for migraine headaches, and naproxen. We kind of talked about that. That's kind of an over-counter medication. Um, so for the sumatriptan, um, it's probably okay to be on depending on how many migraines that you have. So if you have multiple migraines, of course, you probably don't want to fly for at least 48 to 72 hours. So actually, that combination product is not on the FAA uh, safe list, at least as far as I can tell. So, uh, so you know, I'll, I'll look up uh, if... Uh, if you can send me either Joe's or if if Joe can then um, let's see uh, he's got my uh, my my uh, website my player seven at gmail dot com I'll be more than happy to see I'll look through the list and find out uh, which of the migraine medications are safe for the FAA and how long you need to go after the last dose that you took it yeah that's so, that, so that, Joe, that's great is that, you know, for sure here. So that Joseph, that's your homework. Reach out to Larry, remind him about the Treximet question, um, and he can have some research on that for you as well. But Joseph, I'm going to leave the ball in your court there because I'm sure Larry's going to get a ton of emails and have a ton of uh, responses to make anyway. So make that your responsibility, Joseph. That's cool. Um, let's uh, see. Um, uh, Felix. Uh, said 17 million people in the U.S. with diabetes, uh, uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, and too many of them uh, GA pilots. Um, how does type 1 diabetes affect your ability to get granted that um, uh, uh, FAA medical, Larry? Uh, well, as, as I mentioned, that the diabetes type 1 is only a third class, and it's also a special issuance. And uh, as long as you know you can still be on insulin, but you can't you can't get a second class and you can't get a first class. And the thing about it is you got to do your due diligence and be able to take your blood sugars all the time. And especially that scenario that I kind of put together, it's got to be between 100 and no more than 300. And you got to be taking it every hour on long cross countries. And you have to take it before you fly. You have to take it before you land. If you're shooting approaches, you probably need to take 20 uh, grams of glucose because your brain is going to need all the glucose it can get because it's one of the highest requirers of any kind of glucose in order for it to function, in order for you to make the right decisions. Cool. Um, I'll take this next question here. I'm uh, Larry, I'm taking Greg's question that came in at 928. If you see that, I'll take it. But anything under that is fair game if you want to dig through those and see what you'd like to take there. Um, Greg asked a wonderful question. Um, how are the insurance companies going to deal with no third class medical? Um, Pilot Protection Act sort of stuff. And and Greg, you bring up a million dollar question. You know, it's the same kind of question. Like, for example, the Pilot Protection Act sounds great on paper. And then you look at it from a business standpoint sometimes. The same is true. Like, we keep talking about flying cars. And trust me, flying cars are going to happen. I totally believe it. However, geez, you ever think, who's going to insure that sort of stuff? you got a composite aircraft that the way people drive, you know, so, so you're right, Greg. You're, you're in the right mindset here. How are insurance companies going to deal with these pilots not having a third-class medical? Um, I, what I believe is going to happen, and Larry may have some better insight on this than I do because, oddly enough, we're kind of left in the dark with this whole thing. All we're told is – hey, this, this Pilot Protection Act that's coming, we're working on this. We don't get really told the business side of it. But I haven't, uh, I'm haven't. i good friends with quite a few of the, the VPs at uh, some larger insurance companies, uh, aviation insurance companies, and it would be my understanding uh, that we're going to still go off, of course, our experience, 
But age is going to begin to play more of a factor. And I don't believe that's a very fair factor because, um, you know, you can have somebody like Larry who's, you know, as, as fit as ever as opposed to someone who's 40 years old and, and couldn't get a medical because they're, you know, obese. And, and because they're obese, they have these continuing problems. So you can't make a generalization like that. It's a very fine line to walk, uh, Greg, but there are going to be implications um, unfortunately, like you said, because the insurance companies have to, um, you know, cover their uh, investments uh, with that. Larry, I don't know if you have anything else you want to chime in on that. And certainly anything else uh, question wise you may have spotted uh, uh, down there that you might like to take. Yeah. So with the insurance companies, what they're going to do is we have to now when they do when Congress makes any kind of laws and puts it together, they don't think about all of the different like doors that can open once they make one decision and the most important things is it's going to be hard for the insurance companies so if you think like the FAA is conservative the insurance companies are even more conservative so what I would like to you know I would have to do my own research says what insurance companies how are the insurance companies dealing with the sport pilots the people who are buying LSAs and things like that are those people insured? So if they're comfortable about insuring the sports pilots with having had any kind of, uh, you know, just using their driver's license, then I think for the third class medical, that would be an easy transition. But it's all going to be based on very forward, kind of kind of looking towards the future type of people that are running the insurance companies for aviation. So if they have been state of the art, and been dealing with these sport pilots and getting their insurance for their LSAs, then I think that's going to be an easy transition for them to go over to the private pilots without their third class medical. But just like Jason said, they're going to have just like, like these actuary tables that you get when you get your life insurance. All they see is age and what disease states do you have. So, you know, we have patients all the time, they're 85 going on 40. But you also have patients that are 85 going on 102. Well, sometimes in the insurance company's way of looking at that, everybody is 85 going on 102 because uh, that's just the way they think. So I, I think I what I would do is I would just do research and say what are they doing for the sports pilots and which companies they're dealing with because those are the companies that are going to help with the third class medical no more right, when you're just using your driver's license. Excuse me. Cool stuff. Uh, Larry, did you see anything else you wanted to dive into question-wise underneath uh, those there? I think we're going to have to go to at least 11 o'clock because I'd like to answer every single question on here because they're all fantastic questions. Sure. Just, uh, like, sure. Totally understand. Let's. Uh, I'll tell you what, Larry. I, pick out one more. And guys, I'm sorry. There's like 15 more here. And uh, Larry is a 4 a.m. kind of guy. I'm a 5.30 a.m. kind of guy. So uh, we're both – you know, East Coast. Larry, pick out one question out of these 15 down here that, that interests you and you'd like to take. And guys, if we didn't get your question, again, I'm so sorry. But again, Larry's email is pilotlarry7 at gmail.com. Just copy, paste that to him. And during his lunch break, in between rounds tomorrow, uh, I will well, I can't promise because that's not—I'm not Larry. But Larry, you—you you know Larry's heart. He will get to it as soon as he has uh, some time. So, uh, Larry, uh, whatever that uh, million-dollar question is there, let's pick it and let's wrap it up on that note. Okay. Uh, let's see here. It's going to be hard to—you um, know—the ADD question with Adderall is okay. Well, of course, the, you know the FAA doesn't deal well with anything that's going to be amphetamine-like. So. You know, I mean, there are people that I know that have ADD, and I've known that I have been on some of these things, but it's a very, very, very special issuance. It all depends on how long they've been on it and how long has it been since, uh, you know, on what medications that they've had. So, uh, yeah, the other thing is, is I had one person that says they went into AFib only one or two times within the five years, and so what they do is they get cardioverted, they actually get shocked out of it, and... Uh, so the question is, is am I good to go for a few years and that is probably problem? And so, you know, to me, if it only happens like once every five years, it's called lone AFib and there's no way to predict it. And uh, so 
I don't know. As long as they're healthy and they don't, you know, feel the palpitations, I think it's going to be okay. But probably somewhere along the way, Greg, you're probably going to have to like at least see a physician about this and find out what the etiology is. I, you know, I, right now I don't see that it's a problem. But if anybody sees atrial fibrillation on your record, they're going to start asking a lot of questions. Um. I, Larry, I really appreciate you. I, I know it is well past your bedtime. It's well past my bedtime as well. Got my um, jammies on. What's that? I got my jammies on, and it's got the feet on it, and I yeah. got the you know little thing. You're, you're gonna on. need it. Uh, I'm looking at the highs and lows for Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, you're gonna need it, that's for sure. So, Larry, I just want to thank you so much for spending time with us, guys. This recording is gonna be made available uh, in the morning if you want to go back over anything. Again pilotlarry7 at gmail.com uh, is the email address to reach out to world famous Uncle Larry. He'll let him help you with your questions. He'll end up becoming your uncle too because he's just, uh, he's got a heart of gold. And I hope you guys really um, realize that and, and, and value his expertise. So just so thankful, uh, just so blessed to have Larry on this wonderful team here at mzoray.com and so blessed and thankful to have you guys as wonderful fans and friends of M0A.com. So guys, thanks for spending your evening with us. Enjoy the rest.